Internet, what is going on? It has been a hot minute since we've seen each other, and uh, I miss you as well. So what I wanted to do today is walk you through a blog post that I wrote. And the blog post is an argument in accordance to a conversation that I've run into quite a bit. So this is a conversation that I've had with a lot of different security teams, and I've also observed from a distance and observing how companies are reacting to this specific concern and or risk. And the risk that is the concern here is that I as a company, if I have my employees that are using a tool such as ChatGPT, Bard, Claude, Anthro um, not Anthropic, but uh, Perplexity, AI, et cetera, if I'm using these end um, consumer facing tools, these LLMs, there's a chance that I might leak sensitive data to other people that are using this tool. And uh, I, from, this, from this research that I've done and the thinking around this specific concern, I've come to the conclusion that this risk is actually very small. And I think it's blown way out of proportion. Uh, more companies, I think, should really step back and think critically about why we're actually preventing our employees from using these tools. And what are the benefits that are derived from using them? What productivity gains can our employees get from using these tools? So in this blog post, in this video, I'm going to walk you through kind of what that argument is and why I think that it's blown out of proportion. Ruby, let's get started. So uh, first things foremost, disclaimer, I'm planting my flag here and making my argument. I know there's a lot of nuances to it. So I'm hoping that somebody that watches this video and in the comments actually provides a different perspective and maybe new facts that I'm unaware of, specifically in the context of data leakage using LLMs that are not using specific architecture such as RAG, which I'll get into later on. But uh, I, I would love for more feedback on this. I need to make sure that my logic and reasoning is sound on this topic specifically. So like I mentioned, there's a specific uh, persona, not persona, there's a specific scenario in the head of many of these uh, decision makers and security teams around what could potentially happen. And this is a simplistic drawing of what that is. So I have my user, which could be an employee, and my attacker on the other side. And they're using a tool such as ChatGPT. And my specific user, my employee, may or may not accidentally or intentionally put in secret information into ChatGPT to do some sort of task. That information could be a social security number, that could be a phone number, that could be credit cards, that could be whatever else. And the concern here is that a threat actor, if they prompt this model in just the right way, they might actually get out that sensitive information. It could be proprietary code, it could be something else. And that's the concern here. They're afraid that if I put my information into this model, it's gonna be memorized and then leaked to somebody else. Now, my argument here is that this is completely blown up proportion, and it's likely uh, a very, very small statistical way of getting that out, and I'll explain some of the reasonings here. But as I mentioned up here, many companies have adopted this uh, blocking my employees of using tools. Samsung, Verizon, and a whole bunch of other companies have adopted this. Now, like I said, you're, there's a cost-benefit for cost benefit ratio to every decision made. So when an executive or a security um, leader decides to block their employees from using something, especially something as critical as uh, generative AI, there is some serious loss there. And this is just one study. There are many studies, but just one study highlights that there's a 13 or 14 to 34% increase in productivity per hour for employees using tools like this against employees that aren't using tools. So this is something that we should really think about and seriously consider when we're making big decisions like this. Because productivity gains, they, they are derived and, and, and have many different things that manifest from them. That could be, um, different innovative uh, processes that you maybe automate. That could be uh, market share. That could be you know increased revenue. That could be uh, increased customer satisfaction. Like there's many different reasons as to why this is an issue as we're setting aside um, this massive tool that's going to transform a lot of things. So that's uh, the first piece of the argument, uh, or at least kind of like laying the groundwork of the problem. Uh, then also another piece that I mentioned in here is that even if you're using these models and you're concerned about this, there's different things you can do. So you can prompt your employees and tell them to not necessarily prompt your, prompt your employees like a machine. Uh, prompt your employees and let them know that they shouldn't necessarily put sensitive information into these tools. So give them some sort of um, structural policies and guardrails around using these. Uh, another thing is that these tools actually have baked into them different types of filters and privacy mechanisms. So uh, in GPT-4, the technical paper, they explicitly call out that they're actually filtering out uh, privacy information to ensure that they're not putting them into their training data sets. You also have the ability to opt out, which has been around for months now. So there's different things that we can use in these tools to ensure that we're not leaking data or at least re reducing the probability of doing it. So let's get into the argument and, and where I, I kind of see... Uh, where this conversation is going awry and how maybe people aren't necessarily thinking about this critically and doing the research themselves. 
So the first thing here is how, how do these models actually work? What's the, what's the fundamental job of a generative AI model? So hence the name, it generates text. It is not a database. Oftentimes in these conversations, when I talk to people, they immediately default to saying that my data is going to be stored in this model. And it's going to be then regurgitated or memorized and put into the attacker's hands. This is not how they work. They do memorize stuff. And sometimes that can be a concern, but the numbers here are so low that it, that it should not be as big of a risk that people are making out to be because they're generating content they're ge generating information from other information. They're not necessarily memorizing stuff. And there is a study from 2021 where a series of researchers actually uh, counter argued what I'm saying right now. So for GPT-2, they were able to actually, in a semi-reliable fashion, extract sensitive data from the model because it was memorized. Now, if you look at the research and you look at the study, you can see that what they were pulling out were phone numbers and names. And these phone numbers and names were actually repeated consistently and in, in, in large um, quantities. And when memorizing something in a model, which very rarely happens, is there's three things that happen. So first off, we're, there's three variables we wanted to think about, or three factors. So first, we want to think about the frequency of this item in the data set. So this item could be, say, a social security number. And so we have to put this one specific social security number into ChatGPT X number of times. And I'll put actually numbers to this in a second. That's our first factor. The next one is how big is the data size? So is it as small as it big? The bigger the data size, the bigger the model, the higher likelihood it is to memorize things. But still, that likelihood is extremely low. And then last is the memorization tendency. So how um, likely is it to memorize this uh, data based off of the architecture? There's a series of things that actually influence this. So it's the design of the model, the size of the model, and also the training, the training approach that they're using. So after you kind of think about this, you'll have some sort of constant variable that will, that will help us understand what's the likelihood of this being memorized. So if we go down to this section here, I have some beautiful pictures and formulas that I made for you. So this is what we're looking for, likelihood of memorization. There's uh, three variables here. So we have the inherent uh, memorization. So that's the constant number that I mentioned previously. So that can be something that we decide on. We have the data set size and we have, or no, this is the frequency of the data inside of the data set and then the data set size. So I put some numbers in here to give us context. So in this example, say we put in 5 million uh, times one specific SSN. So I'm giggling because this is kind of outrageous. If one employee and puts 5 million of one iteration of a specific social security number into a ChatGPT instance or whatever else, like that, that that's concerning. That's, that's, a big, that's a big red flag as to why that employee is doing that. So that's, in our example, one thing that we can do. The next thing is, okay, what's the data size? For this example, I just chose 500 billion words. And it's really important for me to let you know that this is being extremely conservative on the size. So if you look at Llama 2, we know that they were roughly trained on 2 trillion tokens. I can guarantee you that GPT-4 is the same, if not bigger, than Llama 2. So tokens and words, very similar. So if you kind of equate a token to a word, it's somewhat similar, but usually a token is a little bit smaller than a word. So in the end, if we wanted to kind of get nuanced here, this is likely going to be a little less than 2 trillion, um, but it's still going to be a really massive number. And the last thing is memorization tendency. And this one, you kind of have to guess at this because it depends on the model and all the things I mentioned previously. So I've guessed at uh, point 0.1 here. So this is a small value. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be as kind and as conservative as I can towards the argument of the other side on specifically the risk associated to using in this context. So we have uh, point 0.1 here. So we put all this together and we come out with this number here. So point zero 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 one. That actually comes out to being a one in a million chance of our data actually being leaked in this context. One in a million. You know what else is one in a million? Some fun facts I pulled is getting struck by lightning or having a meteorite land in your backyard. Uh, it kind of just gives you a perspective. It gives you a perspective of looking at these numbers that are very conservative, in the context of how these, uh, how these models work, and also how the data can be leaked. But that's not it. We also have Caleb. So Caleb actually, uh, had a similar argument in a presentation that was about many other things, but in his context of LLM security, he argued specifically these three things, one of which I've already touched on in depth, which is memory threshold. So here, this is the point I've already made, so we can skip that. The next one is formatting. So for this formatting piece, the model not only has to remember the data that we put in 5 million iterations, but it also has to remember the format perfectly. And that is a separate thing for the model to actually understand and comprehend. 
So it's uh, another hurdle that the model has to get over to ensure that they can actually grab that. And so the format could be for an SSN, you have, you know, I think it's four numbers, two numbers, three numbers, phone numbers is 333, three, three, depending on where you live, et cetera, et cetera. But then we have accuracy. So for accuracy, this is specifically referring to how do we ensure that the data that's been given to me as an attacker, so if I'm an attacker over here trying to get data out of the model, I need to actually validate this. How do I validate this in what way? I need to ensure that what it's given to me is not hallucinating. That in itself is probably one of the hardest, most difficult things to do as an actor. And sure, I can validate the SSN against the database, but like you only have so many, so many SSNs you can validate against. Same thing for credit cards, et cetera. And for credit cards, I mean, you can do actually different types of checks on, on e-commerce sites, but for other data sets, it's much more difficult. So that, those are the three pieces that Caleb calls out. That's my argument for the concern. And that's why I think it's a low risk. But I do want to call out specifically at the very bottom of this post, there is a real risk here. And the real risk is nuanced about how we talk about this. And the nuance is that Many people, when they're concerned about data leakage, sometimes they refer to this specific architecture and not necessarily the one that I was referring to previously. And this specific architecture is considered the RAG architecture, or retrieval augmented uh, generation. This is what a lot of people are discussing today around actually ensuring that the model they're using is getting updated data sets. And they're also maybe reaching out to different locations to get uh, data from the internet or whatever else. And we've added a new thing to our diagram here, you can see. What we've added to the diagram is a vector database, which is a form of database where you can actually pull out different types of um, words and information that are kind of uh, semantically similar, or like kind of like close to each other in a vector, vector space. Then we have agents. And the agents are acting on our behalf to do different types of things. So the reason that this is much higher risk than what I discussed above is that an actor, if they prompt the model correctly, they may or may not be able to trick this model into actually going down to our vector database, pulling out specific data, and then feeding that back to our actor. That in itself is, has a higher probability than what I've discussed previously. And that is a concern. And it's a valid concern. But as I mentioned previously, um, there are a lot of things that in these conversations I realized tend to be not as well thought through as they should be, especially when it comes to the importance of using a tool like this where when you give an employee access to a tool that can increase your productivity by almost 35% per hour, um, as a company owner, as an executive, I would want to ensure that I'm, I'm you know, weighing the cost benefit for ratio here around data leakage and et cetera, et cetera. But these tools are way too powerful for us not to allow our employees to use them. Um, sure, we should do it in a safe way, but uh, that's kind of the conclusion I've come to. But as I mentioned previously, uh, in the disclaimer, if I'm missing anything that you feel like I should know about that is in the context of this argument of using LLMs as end users that are not using the RAG architecture or are concerned about data leakage associated to that, um, I'd be happy to be proven wrong and also to understand this argument better. Because like I said, I need to make sure I have a good, strong um, reasoning about this specific problem. With that being said, I appreciate your time, internet, and I will, uh, I'll see you around.